Hi, I'm Gene Price. In this lecture, we'll look at the origins of the common school. We're going to look at three different questions. What were the effects of democracy on society and the schools? Second, how did the social, cultural, and economic changes of this period, we sometimes call this the early republic period, how did it affect public schools and education? And finally, what is the significance of Horace Mann and other educational reformers on the development of the common school? Now, we look at the timeline of events, and there's a lot. And you can come back to this slide and, uh, you know, take notes if you want. But consider that there's a lot going on uh, in American history at this time. And as I said in the previous lecture, what happens in the greater environment of the United States or the region or even the, the local area is going to affect the schools in some way. And we'll see that again in this lecture. The age of the common man, or the age of Jackson. So this is a picture of Andrew Jackson. And these two phrases are often used together, Jackson and the common man. Because during this period of the Republic, from about 1820 to the 1840s, and even into the beginning of the Civil War, on the eve of the Civil War, 1860, you see democracy expanding. More and more people are allowed to vote. Voting goes out of the hands of the wealthy, white, property-owning males into poorer white males. They don't necessarily have to have property. So you broaden the voter base. Now, you're still excluding women for a lot of votes. You're still excluding African Americans, Native Americans, and a lot of other minorities. That's not to say that some don't vote. Because some do, and that's not to say all don't vote because some do, but uh, it's very limited for minorities and women. But for white males, democracy expands. And you also see expansion of territory. So America starts moving further west. Now, at this point, the American West, we're still talking to the Mississippi River. Uh, while we would call that east uh, today, in those days, it was still moving towards the, the west and the southwest, and that is to the Mississippi River. Uh, the big issue that happens right that, 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 that further expands the nation is the annexation of Texas, California, uh, and the parts in between as a result of the Mexican War, the U.S.-Mexican War uh, of 1845, which goes on until 1848 and is ended by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, so that the United States gets a tremendous amount of land and then has to worry about settling that land and expansion, and then that's going to lead to the Civil War. The development of the common school. Now, when we talk about the common school, we're basically talking about a northeastern institution. Uh, we're talking about something that happened in places like Boston, especially, uh, in New York, so in the middle uh, states. Not so much in the South. We're talking about a free tax-supported idea that the schools will be supported by taxpayers, one that is open to all children. Now, when we say all children, there are some questions. Uh, are we talking about integrating races, like with blacks and white children? Some places, but certainly not all. Are we talking about students with physical and mis mental disabilities? In some places, but that wasn't overwhelmingly the case. Are we talking about more women in school? In some limited amounts. So we say open to all children in theory, but in practicality and in actuality, no. We're talking about increased centralization of schools. And we do see... Schools moving away from local control, the school being the center, to having school systems or regional school districts, and a superintendent or somebody in charge of, of that. So the beginnings of centralization of schools. And like in other topics, and I mentioned in the last slide, 
common schools and the development of the school uh, is uh, a reaction to what's going on in the rest of the world. And one of the things you see is America moving. You see different types of ethnicities coming into the United States. And you also see immigration in the 1840s and even a little bit before that from German and Irish. The development of a common curriculum is also central to the idea of a common school. And predominantly, the most well-known book of the period was McGuffey's Readers. Now, McGuffey himself was a former school teacher, and he wanted a book that would teach moral values and some religious virtues. But he's looking at Protestant Christianity. So Catholics aren't going to feel so included in this, and the theology is a little different, but he does present these moral readers to children, basically in grades one through six, but this was a very successful book. And it's surprising, but they continue to be sold even um, for over 130 years. So they were popular. You can still get them online, uh, and you can still buy these McGuffey. I mean, they're, they've changed. They've been updated and whatnot, but the basic structure is still in place. If you were to name any one person associated with the common school movement, it would have to be Horace Mann. Now, Horace Mann was not a teacher. He was an attorney. He came from Massachusetts uh, and studied to be a lawyer, but he also got very involved in politics. Uh, and he becomes a, a lawmaker, a congressperson, uh, and a member of the uh, Board of Education, and finally secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education. And he's in that position for about 12 years. He is a Unitarian. Now, this is a little bit different from Protestantism. Unitarians, uh, this comes out of the um, Transcendentalist movement uh, and the Unitarian movement comes out of that. Uh, and so he is a little bit different. He wasn't raised a Unitarian, but he, had, he converts to Unitarianism. And so his religious beliefs are more inclusive. They're not necessarily uh, related to any one sect, but he does have this belief in progress and in the goodness of human beings at heart. And he does believe that education is important to democracy. So he continues those traditions. He also is the founder of the Common School Journal. So he is really wrapped up in the whole idea of the Common School Movement. Uh, so I'm going to list a couple of quotes from Mann here, uh, post these. Um, and I'll let you look at these for a second. He's talking about the pilgrims. He said they had two divine ideas, duty to God and to posterity. For one, they built the church. For the other, they opened the school. Religion and knowledge, two attributes of the same glorious and eternal truth. And that truth, the only one which immortal or mortal happiness can be securely founded. So in this quote, this is from his 10th annual report, uh, he's kind of blending the ideas of morality and religion and education together. And this second quote uh, by Mann from his 12th annual report from 1849, uh, I'm going to compare it to uh, uh, something that Jefferson said, and I've used this before uh, in a previous lecture. Uh, Jefferson, in this letter to Charles Yancey, a friend of his in 1821, wrote, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. So this was Jefferson's idea of education and its importance uh, in a democracy, in a republic like the one we have here in the United States. Now compare this to what Mann says about 20 years later, a little over 20 years later. Mann says, quote, a republican form of government without intelligence in the people, must be, on a vast scale, what a madhouse without superintendent or keepers would be on a small one. The despotism of a few succeeded by universal anarchy, and anarchy by despotism, with no change but from bad to worse. End quote. So you get this same idea, and a continuation, in fact, an expansion of this idea, that education was important 
to a orderly society and a civilization like the Republic that the United States is at heart. So that education was important to the success of the Republic and in the previous quote about the idea of education and religion being tied together. Now, much of what man and some of these other common school reformers drew their influence from uh, was a Swiss educator named Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. And so what Pestalozzi was talking about um, in his theories of education, he was largely influenced by Romanticism. And he started off as a, as a writer. He wrote several books uh, that were uh, novels and other types of books. And then he moves into educational theory. He, too, was a lawyer. But he is looking at individualism in education and the development of the imagination. So this is also influenced by these romantic ideals. And so how does this apply to, to, to school and to pedagogy? Well, he said one of his quotes was, learning by head, hand, and heart. The idea that education was about the development of the whole child, the whole child in their community. And so in that, it was individualized. So each children's needs would be different. Each children's uh, education would be slightly different, slightly uh, informed by where they grew up uh, and by who they were. So it was this idea of kind of what we might today call holistic education. One of the developments of the common school era was the high school. Now today that seems kind of odd because we've always had high schools that we've grown up in. But the first high school started about 1818 in Boston. And then you see the development of high schools in other states a few years later. And the high schools were kind of seen as higher education. Uh, of their day, this transition between college uh, and elementary school. So as you were gra uh, raising children up in primary schools, elementary schools, and then how are they going to get to college? Well, you needed some sort of transition. So the high schools began filling this gap. One of the earliest ones was in Philadelphia. And at Central High School there in Pennsylvania, they focused on curriculum tied to practical education. Not just learning Greek and Romance languages, but learning practical knowledge, uh, like trades and uh, writing for business and business math. Uh, not on the level we would say that it's business math today, but practical mathematical formulas people needed to know, practical writing skills, practical reading skills. And so, in summary, this was kind of what the common school movement had at heart. You needed a common school for all the people. So what was the effects of society and democracy on these schools? Well, the idea that education should be open to all, and I have a question mark after that, because as we know, you still had segregation. You still had uh, women being segregated as well, or not being allowed to be educated, and certainly not all African American children had opportunities open to them. Uh, Native American children were still quite limited as well. Uh, and what about other immigrant children? Well, ma mainly they were educating their own. So the effects of democracy and the expansion of democracy were kind of limited. How did social, cultural, and economic changes of the period affect education? Well, again, I have a question mark on this. So I would say reaction to the new economy to immigration, and the idea of people. Now, what, is, what do I mean by this? Well, is that schools were adapting as you get new immigrants coming in. Uh, you get new immigrants, the Irish famine of the 40s, uh, German economic woes of the 40s, 1840s, are driving immigrants in, and so you do have more immigrants coming in, Germans coming into the Midwest, Scandinavians coming into the Midwest. You have the Irish fleeing the famine coming into places like Boston and New York, into New Orleans as well. Um, although New Orleans really wasn't part of the United States at that time, you do have various immigration coming in. You're also going to have Germans coming into Texas, uh, even though Texas hasn't, may not have officially joined the Union by this time. It was a republic for a while, and then in '46 it becomes part of the United States. But then you do, this immigration is going to affect it. Once you adapt 
the Southwest following 1848 and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the U.S.-Mexican War. You're going to have more ethnic groups, Native Americans, uh, different types of Native Americans, Mexican Americans. How do these different ethnic groups get into the schools? How is it affecting them? There's no easy answer to, to address that uh, because it varies quite a bit. So these changes, the new immigration, the new uh, absorption of other people, uh, the changes in the marketplace and, the, and the other, other systems are going to affect education, but in a lot of different ways. Now, what about the third question? What about the significance of Horace Mann? Well, what these reformer, reformers can be credited with, like Mann and others, is they began applying new ideas, developing ideas from Europe and at home to education and began changing the way education was perceived and really trying to uh, get more people to buy into the idea of the need for a common free public school system. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about how this idea takes root. Thank you.